Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all in the tonight's uh, program of NHF Cardiac Course. Uh, today's topic of discussion is probably the most important in the field of cardiology because almost all the disease of the heart, whether it be ischemic, structural, valvular, myocardial, pericardial, or hypertensive, ultimately ends up in heart failure. All the burden of heart failure, heart disease ultimately results in the failure of the heart to pump adequately. So today we are really feel honored and uh, privileged to have with us National Professor Brigadier Abdul Malik sir, a founder and president of National Heart Foundation of Bangladesh and former advisor to Kiyatagar government. Uh, we welcome you sir in our program. And we also have with us with two eminent cardiologists of Bangladesh, Professor Shajal Krishna Banerjee, Dean of Faculty of Medicine and Professor and Chief of Cardiology, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. Probably uh, due to some uh, personal reasons, he will not be able to join us. We also have with us Professor Dr. Chaudhary Meshkat Ahmed, Professor of Cardiology, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, very academic and honest critic of knowledge. Uh, welcome, Dr. Meshkat. And we have uh, four very talented uh, speakers with us. They will discuss different uh, aspects of today's topic. Uh, before we start, uh, I, may I request Brigadier Professor Abdul Malik, sir, to make some uh, opening remarks. Thank you. Very Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Professor Duman and other respected faculty and participants, Assalamu Alaikum. I am very happy to be here in this evening in this important topic which you are hearing, heart failure. As you have told, all roads lead to Rome, means any heart disease can lead to heart failure. And particularly in this age, when people are going gradually, longevity is increasing, so there is more chances of heart failure. And this will be really a problem for future cardiologists. Because once somebody has got heart failure, chronic heart failure, it has become chronic and it is definitely a burden to family, society and the nation. You will have to manage them properly, keep them in working condition, and the heart failure, physiology, pathology, and also mechanism and treatment. One should know how it happens. I am sure today the distinguished speaker will speak of this, and I will tell the participants to think about it. And whoever you are using any medicine, you must know all the drugs used in cardiology are potentially dangerous. So whenever you use, you must know why and how you are using. Sometimes there is a term, intractable heart failure. And I have seen in many cases, intractable heart failure means you are not probably treating the patient properly with adequate doses. So what dose is bad, under dose is bad. And why you are giving, you should know it. So you should think about it and give the medicine not by memory. So please utilize the time, learn it, and utilize your knowledge with content so that you do not do any harm to anybody. If you do not understand something, please consult one of your friend or senior colleague because you should not do any harm to anybody. Thank you very much. I hope this will be very useful for every one of you. There is no end to learning. And you will see a lot of changes going on. In our ages when we started our medical practice, at that time there was no diuretic, nothing it is. Treatment was different. And probably after a few years there will be a lot of changes going on gradually. So try to keep your knowledge abreast and do good to people. Thank you very much. And I'd like to leave you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you uh, very much for your value, valuable speech. Uh, I think sir will leave us uh, because sir was very tired today. He attended a long meeting uh, with the ministry. So thank you, with, uh, thank you sir. Thank you, uh, so, thank you, sir. So with the permission of uh, uh, other panel, panelists, may I start the session? So uh, our, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Shamim Kodri. He'll be speaking about the definition, pathophysiology, and classification of heart failure. Dr. Shamim Chaudhary, please. Share your screen. Honorable uh, National Professor uh, Brigadier Abdul Malik, sir, uh, <clears throat> Professor Fazila Malik, madam, uh, respected moderator, and uh, panel of expert and distinguished uh, participants. Assalamu alaikum. My topic of presentation will be definition, classification, and pathophysiology of heart failure. Heart failure uh, may be defined uh, very simply as when heart cannot maintain adequate cardiac output and circulation to meet the demand of the tissues. However, in other words, heart failure can be defined as a complex clinical syndrome resulting from structural and functional impairment of ventricular filling or ejection of blood. Worldwide, uh, heart failure affects almost 23 million uh, people uh, with the economic burden of 108 billion uh, US dollar and 50% of heart failure patients die within five years from the diagnosis. And it is the number one cause of hospitalization among the patients aged more than 65 years. And the vast majority of heart failure patients has three or more comorbidities uh, like the COPD, uh, anemia, uh, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, angina, renal dysfunction, and sleep apnea. However, there is positive of data regarding the heart failure in Bangladesh. In a hospital-based retrospect retrospective study was done in a National Heart Foundation Hospital between the January 2005 to August 2006 by Kobrit Joman et al. under the guidance of Professor uh, Malik Sar which showed that about one seventh of the patients admitted had heart failure. That was the 14.1% of totally admitted patients. Mean age of the hospitalized heart failure patients were a little bit uh, lower, that is 54.1 to 15.3 years, which was a bit, a bit higher in European studies with higher prevalence in male than female. And coronary heart disease is the main cause of the heart failure with the 35.79%. Uh, followed by the valvular heart disease, that is 22%, where there is hypertension and diabetes mellitus is the primary risk factor. Chronic heart failure patients were more prevalent among the uh, patient population, that is 71.3% versus 28.7% of acute cases. Among the congenital heart diseases, ventricular septal defect and patent ductus arteriosus were most common cause of uh, heart failure. Moderate rate of the study population were 9.7% and higher in uh, male. Now, classification of heart failure is very diverse. It can be classified according to the involvement of the chamber. There are functional classification, assistion, aha, staging of heart failure, uh, according to the ejection fraction, according to the time course or onset of heart failure, and there is clip classification for post myocardial infarction risk stratification. According to the involvement, there are left heart failure, right heart failure, or biventricular failure. There is a term that is core pulmonary, which is used either to describe right heart failure, secondary to chronic lung disease with or without right ventricular hypertrophy. Left heart failure has some subtypes also like forward failure and backward failure, and high output failure or low output failure. And there is a New York Heart Association functional classification to see the status of the patient. There is a class one has no limitation of physical activity. Uh, ordinary physical activity does not cause symptoms of heart failure. And class two, there will be slight limitation of physical activity. Ordinary physical activity results in symptoms of heart failure, but patient will be comfortable at rest. Class three, there will be marked limitation of physical activity. The less than ordinary activity will cause symptoms of heart failure, but patient will be comfortable at rest. Class four is the symptoms at heart failure at rest and unable to carry on physical activity without symptoms of heart failure. This is a SSA AHA staging of the heart failure. It has four stages. Among that, stage A and B 
are those patients who are at risk for heart failure and stage C and D are the overt heart failure. Stage A is, are the, those patients who are at high risk for heart failure but without structural heart disease or symptoms of heart failure. Like the patients with hypertension, diabetes, obesity. Stage B is a structural heart disease but without uh, sign and symptoms of heart failure like the previous myocardial infarction, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, asymptomatic valvular heart disease. This can progress to the symptoms. That is a stage C heart failure. That is a structural uh, heart disease with prior or current symptoms of heart failure. And the stage D is the refractory heart failure that requiring specialized interventions. And this is an, uh, another pictorial showing the pyramid of the an association of NOAH classification with SEC AHA staging. Uh, that is done by the Olmsted sur uh, clinical survey of the heart failure. It shows very strange, uh, uh, exciting uh, result that is on stage A and B have no NYHA classification that their function, uh, function is, functional status is okay. But these groups stage A and B have majority of the patients with the stage A are the 50 to 60 million patients. Another classification by European Society of Cardiology 2016 guideline, uh, it, it was based on the ejection fraction, that is heart failure can, with preserved ejection fraction, heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction, and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction are those patients who have LB ejection fraction less than 40%. Heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction are LB ejection fraction 40 to 49%. And heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is left ventricular ejection fraction more than is equal to 50%. However, they are heart failure mid-range and preserved ejection fraction are associated with some other criteria like elevated natriuretic peptides and at least one additional criteria like relevant structural heart disease or diastolic dysfunction. Heart failure mid-range ejection fraction are those patients Either they could deteriorate from heart failure preserved ejection fraction or they may can shift from heart failure reduced ejection fraction either by management like revascularization or medical management or device therapy. Now, according to the time course or onset of heart failure, it can be classified as acute heart failure, chronic heart failure, and there is a new term that is chronic stable heart failure that was termed as a treated patient with symptom and signs that have remained generally unchanged for at least one month. And another one is worsening or decompensated heart failure that is sometimes was termed as acute decompensated heart failure. The CLIP classification was done to see the 30 day mortality post myocardial infarction patient in revascularization era. CLIP class one has no evidence of chronic heart failure. Uh, CLIP class two, there will be raised JBP uh, or gallop and class 3 will be pulmonary edema and class 4 will be cardiogenic shock. Now as a heart failure is a progressive disease, when we see the patient that is too late for us, that is patient has developed symptoms, but we can change this scenario either by early intervention like risk factor modification or by evaluation by biomarkers or echocardiography to evaluate the systolic or diastolic dysfunction or evaluation for coronary artery disease or left ventricular hypertrophy. Now etiology, uh, regarding the etiology, it can be classified according to the mechanism of heart failure, like reduced ventricular contractility, such as myocardial infarction or myocarditis or cardiomyopathy, ventricular outflow tract obstruction, like hypertension or aortic stenosis, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary stenosis, ventricular inflow obstruction, mitral stenosis, tricuspid stenosis, Diastolic dysfunction, constative pericarditis. Ventricular volume overload in a situation like mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation, or atrial septal defect or ventricular septal defect. Arrhythmia can cause also heart failure either by tachyarrhythmia or bradyarrhythmia. Now, pathophysiology. Pathophysiology, not a single mechanism can explain the pathophysiology of heart failure. It is very complex pathophysiology. Uh, first of an index event either by cardiac or extra cardiac injury, it will activate the neurohormonal activation and that will lead to the remodeling of the uh, left ventricular myocardium, which will interconnect each other 
and progress to the heart failure. That is an, another pictorial showing after the index event, the changes in the heart, there is some secondary changes, neurohormonal activation, like sympathetic system activi activity and uh, RAS system activation and endothelial dysfunction, which leads to the progressive heart failure that causes some compensatory mechanisms like uh, vasoconstriction of sodium and water retention, which leads to the increase after load and increase in intravascular volume. And this uh, chain reaction goes and goes and patient develops the progressive heart failure, that is chronic heart failure. And this is a, another diagram uh, showing the graphical presentation of Frank Starling relation uh, shown with the heart failure. In a normal heart, usually uh, there is a steep and positive relationship between the preload and stroke volume or cardiac output. There is an increase in preload, there will be increase in the cardiac output. However, in case of heart failure, like in the mild dysfunction or stage A and B dysfunction, the patient will achieve the cardiac output in spite of increased LV and diastolic feeling pressure. Uh, feeling pressure, but in case of severe dysfunction, increase in preload or LV and diastolic pressure or feeling pressure will not increase the cardiac output. However, from mild dysfunction, it can improve either by the use of diuretics or by the evidence of fluid retention. And this is a picture showing the mediators released in heart failure. Among these, the myocardial stress is the key factor to release the most important uh, uh, mediators that are natriuretic peptides. It is a very uh, important for prognostic and diagnosis of heart failure. There are three types of natriuretic peptides, atrial natriuretic peptides, B-type natriuretic peptides, and C-type natriuretic peptides. B-type natriuretic peptides are again, has two parts, that is active PNP and N-terminal pro-BNP. These peptides are considered counter-regulatory because they tend to reduce radiatory pressure, systemic vascular resistance, aldosterone secretion and sympathetic nerve stimulation and can enhance sodium excretion that is natriuresis. This is of importance due to some reasons like there is a enzyme that is natriuresin which uh, inactivates this natriuretic peptides. In there is some there is a new drug called secovitriol which inhibits this enzyme so that natriuretic peptides remain active so that this counter-regulatory uh, function can goes on and patient may benefit from this. Another entity is the heart failure preserved ejection fraction. It is now assumed that it is the 50% of the patients of heart failure have normal ejection fraction. However, it was previously said that it was diastolic heart failure or diastolic dysfunction heart failure. But nowadays it is termed as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction as because only diastolic dysfunction cannot produce heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. LV relaxation and feeling abnormality is a factor for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. However, LV and left atrial structural remodeling, skeletal muscle and endothelial function, and change in the LV and systemic and pulmonary vascular compliance, and inflammatory signaling and prophybrotic signaling are, are the key factors for development of half puff. There are some Etiologies for the half puff patients like the lung diseases, left ventricular diastolic dysfunction, atrial dysfunction, autonomic dysfunction, diabetes, hypertension, hyper, uh, obesity, aging, and renal uh, dysfunction, anemia. Another entity is the acute heart failure. Acute heart failure can be either a de novo dis, uh, dysfunction of previously normal heart or acute worsening of known chronic uh, dysfunction which can be due to vascular endothelial dysfunction or due to neurohormonal activation or cardiorenal syndrome or inflammatory or oxidative stress. Thank you all for patient here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shamim. So uh, I think we should uh, keep our question answer session after Completing. For example, should I, should I think that's a good idea because we want to keep in time. And so we can... we'll, we'll have, we'll have, okay, then our, so the, our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Kabir Zaman, Associate Professor of Cardiology. He will be talking about clinical feature and diagnosis of heart failure. Dr. Kabir Zaman, please. Okay, sir. Thank you. 
So with due respect to all and salam to all and praying in safe and, and prosperous days in, uh, for all in this COVID era, I'm going to talk about the clinical features and diagnosis of the heart failure. In the initially, I want to still that in spite of invention of all the modalities for diagnosing, diagnosis of heart failure, still it is the clinical diagnosis that is remains the gold standard for diagnosis of heart failure. So my topics is clinical features and diagnosis. So approach to a patient of heart failure, a complete medical history, carefully focused physical examination are the foundation of assessment of heart failure patient. These two are very important for diagnosis. And medical history and physical examination will provide information regarding etiology of the heart failure, identifying possible exacerbating factor, leading pivotal data for proper management, guide the further direction of patient's evaluation, enable the clinician to make the most judicious use of additional tests. And this one slide, I want to have the, is my, it, it was the first slide in my life that constructed with my imagination. In our previous starting of the, this session, our beloved and respected professor Malik Sarayab cited that all road leads to Rome. Actually, that thinking I have implanted there, that all the causes of heart diseases ultimately lead to heart failure, as like all the waterfalls and rivers ultimately drains into sea to be evaporated for infinity. Actually, heart failure, it leads to be evaporated for infinity. We want to just delay the evaporation. And I have seen some of the speakers using this slide. I am grateful to them. Now the symptoms of heart failure. These are the, there are patient may complain of vast array of symptoms like fatigue, shortness of breath, dyspnea, tachypnea, cough, diminished exercise capacity, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, nocturia, weight gain, edema, increasing abdominal guard, abdominal pain, loss of appetite, sin stroke respiration, somnolence or diminished mental activity. But some of the symptoms are important like dyspnea and fatigue. So I will highlight some of the features, not all. None of the symptoms are entirely sensitive or specific for identifying the presence of severe condition. These are fallacies, but some are more reliable than others for indication. Importantly, none is specific to heart failure with ejection fraction versus heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Now, regarding the dyspnea, dyspnea is a cardinal symptom of heart failure, typically related to increased cardiac feeling pressures. Dyspnea at rest has high diagnostic sensitivity and prognostic ramification. Breathlessness on lying flat orthopnea is usually associated with the left ventricular failure. And patients with acute pulmonary edema usually prefers to be upright. Now regarding the fatigue, fatigue is an another cardinal symptom of heart failure, reflective of reduction in cardiac output and abnormal skeletal muscle metabolic response to exercise. Regarding the sin stroke respiration, it is usually common in advanced heart failure and indicative of adverse prognosis. Now the symptoms of the right heart congestion are weight gain, increasing abdominal guard, early satiety because of liver congestion, onset of edema in the dependent organs like extremities and scrotum, right upper quadrant pain due to liver congestion. <clears throat> now the physical findings of heart failure. There is a very good list of physical findings like tachycardia, extra beats, narrow pulse pressure or thready pulse, pulses alternance, tachypnea, cool and mottled extremities, elevated jugular venous pressure, dullness or diminished breath sounds, rails, ronchi, wheezes, apical impulse, displaced left and or inferiorly sustained apical impulse, parasternal lift, 
third or fourth third sound, tricuspid mitral regurgitation, murmur, hepatomegaly, ascites, presectal edema, anacerca, pedal edema, chronic venous stasis changes. I will highlight some of the important physical findings. So the physical findings complement the information from the medical history in defining the presence and severity of heart failure. And first of all, you have to add, give your attention for patient general appearance and measurement of vital signs in seated and standing position and examination of the heart and pulse, assessment of the other organs for evidence of congestion and hypoperfusion, and obviously you have to assess the comorbid conditions. So from patient's general appearance, you will get some vital information like body habitus and state of the alertness should be assessed, whether the patient is comfortable, short of breath, coughing or in pain. Skin examination may show pallor or cyanosis resulting from under perfusion. Regarding cardiac impulse, the perfusion of the apical impulse lead to rapid determination of the heart size and quality of the point of maximal impulse. Regarding the auscultation, murmur is a crucial part of heart failure evaluation and characteristics holosystolic murmur of MR is hard in many patients and tricuspid regurgitation can be differentiated from murmur by evaluating the visibility of the V wave in the jugular venous pressure. Now regarding the aortic stenosis, there will be some fallacy. The intensity of the murmur of aortic stenosis depends on blood flow across the valve which may be reduced as heart failure develops. Now, auscultation of the third heart sound. It is a crucially important finding and suggests increased ventricular filling volume. While difficult to identify, it is a highly specific for heart failure and carries a substantial prognostic meaning. Regarding the fourth third sound, the presence of S4 usually indicate the reduced ventricular compliance. Now the summation gallop, what does it mean? In advanced heart failure, the third and fourth heart sounds may be superimposed, resulting in summation gallop. Now the key objective of examination of the heart failure patient is to evaluate the volume of alert and to detect the quanti detect and quantify the presence of volume retention with or without pulmonary congestion and systemic congestion. These are the key points. So congestion may occur in two different circuit or simultaneously in two circuit. One is the pulmonary circuit, another is the systemic circuit. This is very important for management purpose. Now regarding the volume overload, hap pep and hap rep. Patient with heart failure with PGF ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction do not generally show significant differences in frequency or significance of stigmata volume overload. Now, the assessment of the volume overload by measuring the JVP, jugular venous pressure, and this measurement is most definitive method for assessing patients' volume status by physical examination. And the volume overload of pulmonary congestion that is exceedingly common in heart failure, and it is manifested as pleural effusion, and leakage of fluid from pulmonary capillaries into the alveoli. So the pulmonary congestion, that is volume overload in pulmonary circuit can be clinically or physically found as rails, bronchi and wheezing. Not wheezing may result from reactive bronchospasm. Now another importantly, rails and bronchi may be absent in congested patients with absent, advanced heart failure. This may reflect compensatory increases in local lymphatic drainage. So this is important. <clears throat> now there is some term cardiac asthma is caused by physical presence of fluid in the bronchial wall as well as secondary bronchospasm. Caution, it can result in incorrect diagnosis of obstructive airway disease exacerbation. So be careful about it. Now volume overload in heart failure that has been manifested as lower extremity edema. These are common finding in volume overloaded heart failure patients, but other causes of lower extremity edema should be sought out like venous insufficiency, side effect of medication, 
and careful inspection of jugular venous pressure helps improve the specificity of pedal edema in heart failure. Now the physical findings in heart failure to evaluate the reduced cardiac output and systemic hypoperfusion. So reduced cardiac output and systemic hypoperfusion, detecting reduced cardiac output and systemic hypoperfusion are key component of examination. So what does it mean by systemic hypoperfusion? Hypoperfusion. So it can be evaluated by patients with poor systemic perfusion, usually have low systolic and narrow pulse pressure, as well as weak and thready pulses. But this relationship is not exact. Many patients with systolic blood pressure in the range of 80 millimeter or even lower may have adequate perfusion, whereas others with reduced the expense of tissue perfusion by increasing the systemic vascular resistance. So the findings suggesting reduced cardiac output are poor maintenance, reduced urine output, mortal screen, cool extremities. Of this, the cool extremities are the most broadly useful marker to, reduce, to decide about the reduced cardiac output. So these are the physical findings on behalf of congestion, and these are the physical findings on behalf of low perfusion. In favor of congestion, that is orthopnea, elevated jugular venous pressure, pulmonary rails, S3 gallop edema. And in favor of low perfusion, narrow pass pressure, cool extremities, and hypotension. So now you have to uh, interpret all the findings. Like if it is on the basis of the systemic congestion and reduced cardiac output, the patient may be dry and warm. That means uncongested with normal perfusion, wet and warm, congested with normal perfusion, dry and cold uncongested with hypoperfusion, weight and cold, cardiogenic shock. These have some management issue. So this is important. And I think this will be discussed by Abhida. Now the investigations. There are, these are the uh, these are list of investigation. Among these, the colorful ones are practiced in our day-to-day -day daily, daily practice, like ECG, chest radiography, blood chemistry, hematologic variables and echocardiography. <clears throat> Regarding the ECG is a standard part of initial evaluation of patients with suspected heart failure. It may provide important clues regarding incident heart failure. And in patients, uh, heart failure patients, the ECG infrequently normal, but it may show non-specific findings. <clears throat> Note that all causes of heart failure will lead to heart failure. Heart diseases will lead to heart failure. So, ECG will reflect the etiologic factor of the disease of individual patient as well as features of the hemodynamic decompensations and arrhythmias. <clears throat> Sinus tachycardia caused by sympathetic activation in advanced heart failure or during episode of acute decompensation. Atrial arrhythmias as well as ventricular response may provide clues to the cause of heart failure. AF with first ventricular rate in mitral valve disease is an example for exacerbating the heart failure. <clears throat> Evaluation of the QRS complex becomes a critical part of clinical assessment of CRT implantation and QT interval over prolonged electrolyte abnormality, myocardial disease, effect of drugs. And a length in QT interval may identify patients at risk for prosthesis deformities. Now regarding the chest radiography, should be a routine part of the early evaluation of patient presented with symptoms suggestive of acutely decompensated heart failure. And results of X-ray chest are additive to the clinical variables from history and physical examination and complement the results of biomarker testing. So classic X-ray pattern in patients with pulmonary edema is a butterfly pattern of interstitial and alveolar opacities bilaterally finding out of the periphery of the lungs. And this is the classical example of the alveolar edema butterfly shape. There are other chest x-ray. Many patients present with subtle findings of increased interstitial markings, that is curly V lines. These are thin horizontal linear opacities extending to the pleural surface caused by accumulation of fluid in the interstitial space. And this is the example of the curly V line. Thank you, Dr. Shamim, for providing me this 
wonderful, nice slide. Now, XHS, many patients present with evidence of prominent upper lobar vasculature indicating pulmonary venous hypertension. And this is the example of the upper lobar diversion, the pulmonary venous hypertension. <clears throat> many patients with, may present with pleural efficiency, fluid in the right minor fissure. But important note and caution is that many patients, particularly with advanced heart failure, the chest radiography may be entirely clear despite significant symptomic dyspnea. So the negative predictive value of chest radiography is too low to definitely exclude heart failure. So it's a clinical diagnosis, heart failure. Now the measurement of the blood chemistry and hematologic variables in patients with heart failure. These are the least of <clears throat> factors that can be measured. But for diagnostic purpose, it is important with the natriuretic peptide. Others are for, used for evaluation for etiology and risk factors. Now the, regarding the biomarkers. Biomarkers are now routinely used to distinguish heart failure patient from other conditions and establish severity of the diagnosis and provide useful prognostic information in heart failure. And these are the least of biomarkers but all are not used in clinical practice. In clinical practice, only the natriuretic peptides are useful biomarker for heart failure diagnosis and estimation of the heart failure severity and prognosis. And the most frequently measured natriuretic peptides are B-type natriuretic peptide and NT-pro-BNP. That is, the, it has been talked by Dr. Shamim. And these biomarkers are released from cardiomyocytes from cardiomyocytes in response to stress. Now, imaging modalities for assessment of the heart failure. And these are the non-invasive cardiac imaging serves a vital role in assessment of the patients with heart failure because these are essential for determining whether the patient should be classified as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, mid-range mid ejection fraction, or reduced ejection fraction. And imaging may help confirm the diagnosis of heart failure. So for example, dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, these are the primary imaging modalities used in clinic, used for detection for in heart failure. Actually, echocardiography, magnetic resonance imaging, computed tomography, and nuclear imaging. Echocardiography is widely and vastly used. It's a wonderful instrument and Transthoracic echo is an important part of evaluation of heart failure and can be performed without risk at the patient at bedside. It is well suited for evaluating evaluation of the structure function of both myocardium and heart valves and provide information about intracardiac pressure and flow. And it can be used for assessment of the systolic function and diastolic function of the heart can be done very efficiently. And for assessment of the systolic function can be done by semi-quantitatively, by eyeballing, or by modified Simpson's rule. Now, on the basis of the systolic function, the LV systolic function based on measurement of the left ventricular ejection fraction, the patient can be classified as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, ejection fraction more than 50, heart failure with gray area or mid-range Ejection fraction, these have been talked by Dr. Shamim that I am just repeating it 40 to 49, and reduced ejection fraction is less than 40%. Another important function, diastolic function, can be assessed. It is using the Doppler measurement of the technique of the echo, the mitral info pattern of early wave and atrial waveform, tissue velocities of mitral annulus, pulmonary vein flow, LV volume index to body surface area. Now, diastolic dysfunction can be classified one to four, but E by E prime is particularly helpful to determine the presence and severity of the diastolic dysfunction. And E by E prime is more than 15 is abnormal. And these are the list of E by E prime that indicate the pulmonary capillary waste pressure. That is E by E prime more than 15 indicate the PCWP is more than 20. That is LV EDP at least more than 16 millimeter mercury. So these are the list of E by E prime, how it does means the LV EDP. And this is by the courtesy of Dr. M. M. Khan. 
Now, lung ultrasound in heart failure increasingly used to evaluate patients presenting with emergency department, useful to diagnose interstitial pulmonary edema, fluid overload through the detection of the vertical reverberation artifacts known as the curly B line. But this curly B line of lung ultrasound and curly B line in X ray is a bit different. But I think in future clinical practice, lung ultrasound will play important role in deciding or uh, for diagnosis of the clinical uh, heart failure. <clears throat> so curly B lines may be highly sensitive and specific for presence of heart failure, particularly when incorporated with clinical judgment and other tools such as chest radiograph and neck tube diet. So this is the algorithm. I'm at the end of my lecture. Algorithm for diagnosis of the heart failure. I have taken it from guideline, ASC guideline 2016. These are the clinical history, physical examination, and ECG. The three component, if more than one component is present, then go for manage, measurement of the nectarivated peptide. If it is negative, then heart failure are unlikely. And if all three are the negative, then heart failure if absent, then heart failure is unlikely. But if more than one component is present, then an uh, nectarivity peptide is uh, positive, then go for echocardiography. That may lead you some etiological and uh, hemodynamic assessment of the heart failure. So this is the end of my lecture. Thanks to all for patient sharing. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kabir Zaman, for a very informative lecture on clinical feature and uh, diagnosis of heart failure. Uh, our next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Abhida Tasneem Reza. She will be talking on management of heart failure. Dr. Abhida Tasneem. Honorable panelists, respected moderator, my respected teachers, students, and dear learned audience, assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon. I'm Dr. Abhida Tasneem Reza. Registrar, National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute, welcome you all on my topic, that is the management of heart failure. <clears throat> Let me start with uh, two case scenarios. Case one, a 65-year-old gentleman presented with prior history of coronary artery disease and prior bypass surgery is now on maximum doses of carbidilol, ramipril, and spironolactone. He has recent history of hospitalization and still feels short of breath despite these three drugs. His vitals are within normal limits and ejection fraction is 32% at rest. Now the question is, what would be the next treatment plan in this gentleman and how to initiate the treatment? Case number two, a 53 year old woman with a history of old myocardial infarction and chronic heart failure presents to the emergency room and she reports being short of breath. On examination, she is cold and clammy. Her blood pressure is 60 over 40 millimeter of mercury. She has tachycardia and tachypnea and on auscultation of the lungs, there was bilateral crepitation up to mid zone. So the question arises, what will be the approach of management in this lady? Hopefully at the end of my presentation, we will be able to answer all these questions. So the topics that I will be discussing are management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, management of heart failure with preserved and mid-range ejection fraction, acute heart failure management, and management of refractory or advanced heart failure. Now, each hospital should have a primary heart failure pro program, which should include primary care, general cardiology care, and advanced heart failure services. And heart failure management should always be multidisciplinary approach. Cardiologists, primary care physicians, and heart failure nurses, as well as other modalities of specialties should also take part in management of individual patient. So what are the goals of our treatment? First of all, definitely improvement of clinical status, functional capacity, and quality of life. This is most important. Secondly, as these group of people have repeated hospital admission, our second goal will be to prevent repeated hospital admission and ultimately to reduce mortality. The treatment modalities include general management, pharmacological management, and interventional or surgical management. 
Now, American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association guideline 2013 recommend that there is incremental addition of treatment as the heart failure progresses from stage A to stage D. And what about the general management? The foremost important is patient education as well as the education of relatives and caregivers. They should be explained the nature of the disease and treatment. They should adopt some self-help strategies such as daily weight measurement and also patients should be educated regarding improved adherence to management. Now, what will be the diet of these patients? First of all, sodium restriction in all patients two to three gram per day and less than two gram in case of moderate to severe heart failure patient. Despite popular beliefs, fluid restriction is generally unnecessary. Fluid restriction less than two liter per day, specifically in hyponatremic patients or patients with fluid retention despite high doses of diuretics. And caloric supplementation is required in advanced heart failure and cardiac cachexia patients. Now, exercise. Generally, heavy exercise is not encouraged in this group of patients, but it has been seen that exercise reduces the morbidity as well as mortality in different randomized controlled trials. So hospital supervised 12 week exercise training program followed by 25 to 30 minutes per day and five days a week home-based aerobic exercise on a treadmill or stationary bicycle is recommended. Other parts of general management include treatment of hypertension, diabetes mellitus, control of lipid, cessation of smoking, avoidance of alcohol and illicit drugs, avoidance of drugs precipitating heart failure, such as NSAIDs, corticosteroids, and annual vaccination of influenza and pneumococcal vaccine. Several papers supports that this vaccination yearly reduces the hospital readmission. Now, the pharmacological management. The mainstay of treatment include AC inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, beta blockers, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, diuretics, and the recent addition angiotensin receptor blocker neprilysin inhibitor, popularly known as ARNI. Except diuretics, all five have mortality benefits. And other treatment options include digoxin, evabradin, hydralazin isosorbate dinitrates, calcium channel blockers, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid, and recently sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors, that is empagliflozin, dapagliflozin. So as we have already seen the pathophysiology, these drugs act on different pathophysiological pathways and improve the symptoms as well as mortality and morbidity. Now, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and mid ejection fraction are almost similar. So management of these two conditions are similar uh, in this, despite the different pharmacological treatment options in reduced ejection fraction. All the drugs that have mentioned are important for treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, except calcium channel blocker, which is contraindicated. Whereas in heart failure with preserved and mid range ejection fraction, the only two drugs that have shown some efficacy are diuretics and calcium channel blockers. Now, stage A and stage B, as we have already known, the stage E is our at risk heart failure patients and B are asymptomatic heart failure patients. Can we prevent or delay the development of heart failure in these patients? Yes. AC inhibitors and beta blockers have shown to be effective to delay the development of overt heart failure or even prevent death before the symptoms onset. Now, what about the symptomatic patients? The symptomatic patients with reduced ejection fraction, we have to add two drugs simultaneously, AC inhibitors and beta blocker. And we have to achieve the tar maximum target dose. What about the maximum target dose? For example, if we start Riamipril at 2.5 milligram daily, the target dose that we have to achieve is 10 milligram once daily. And what about beta blockers? If we start carbidolol at 3.125 BD, the target dose we should achieve is 25 milligram BD. Now, if the patient is still symptomatic, 
and ejection fraction is still low, so we have to add a third drug that is mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. And spinolactone starting dose will be 25 once daily, followed by target dose to be achieved is 50 milligram once daily. Patient still symptomatic, what we can do? Of course, if the patient is receiving SCV inhibitor or ARB, we have to replace the drug with army. The paradigm heart failure trial has shown clear mortality benefit over enalapril, and we have to use this uh, army safe prescribing dose. That is, patient taking AC inhibitor, we ask the patient to discontinue the AC inhibitor 36 hours before starting army. And in case of angiotensin receptor blocker, we ask them to stop for 12 to 24 hours. Now, if the patient is sinus rhythm, heart rate more than equal to 70, we can use evabradin at this stage. We can also consider device therapy. During all these stages, if any time patient shows any symptom of congestion, we can use diuretics. Now, patient with all these drugs, if there is no symptom, we will continue the treatment. But if resistant, then we can consider other drugs like digoxin, hydrolyzin, nitrate combined therapy, or entry PUFA therapy. Some of the diuretics that we commonly use are loop diuretics, thiazide diuretics, and regarding the potassium sparing diuretics, we have to be very careful to adjust the dose along with the AC inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker. There have been several studies which shows that adding therapies is adding life. So there have been many guidelines, many references, but still, unfortunately, the most commonly prescribed class of agent is diuretics and Unfortunately, AC inhibitors and beta blocker, most of the cases do not reach, achieve the target recommended dose. Now, what about the treatment options for heart failure with preserved and mid-range ejection fracture? No treatment has yet been shown to reduce morbidity and mortality in these two groups of patients. However, diuretics, calcium channel blockers, and management of underlying disease have shown some improvement of signs and symptoms. Now, there have been some relevant comorbidities that already been discussed that require particular medical attention, such as coronary artery disease, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, diabetes mellitus, lipid disorders, sleep apnea, which is important, depression, renal dysfunction, arthritis, anemia, COPD, liver dysfunction, cachexia and muscle wasting, and electrolyte imbalance. Targeting some of the comorbidities will improve symptoms and improve the exercise capacity and quality of life. Now we move on to management of acute heart failure. The immediate goal of management of acute heart failure is to prevent the organ damage along with maintenance of oxygenation and also relieve the symptom of the patient. The intermediate goal will be to start the oral therapy and start titrating the doses. The pre discharge and long-term management will be to enroll the patient in a rehabilitation program so that we can prevent repeated hospital admission of these patients and also to reduce the mortality among these groups. Now, how we can manage the acute heart failure patient. Patient with acute heart failure, definitely we have to position the patient in proper position. We have to give high flow oxygen or adequate ventilatory support, try to identify the etiology. But very important is that we have to assess bedside very quickly the hemodynamic profile of this patient whether there is presence of congestion or not. If the patient has features of congestion, either systemic or peripheral venous congestion, we categorize this patient as weight patient. If there is no sign of congestion, then these are dry patient. Secondly, we have to see whether the patient has adequate peripheral perfusion. If adequate peripheral perfusion, then we term them as wet and warm. Typically, they have elevated or normal blood pressure. If peripheral perfusion is inadequate, then these group will be weight and cold patient. Similarly, the dry patients are categorized as dry and warm patient and dry and cold patient. Now, weight and warm patient, they can be again vascular type and cardiac type. The vascular type where the hypertension predominates and cardiac type where the congestion predominates. So, we can use in vascular type when there is hypertension, vasodilators and diuretics. These are the two treatment options. In congestion type, wet and warm patient will start diuretics followed by vasodilators. Ultrafiltration is another treatment option in diuretic resistant case. Now, wet and cold patient, that is patient has pericongestion and also inadequate peripheral perfusion, whether the patient has 
systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeter of mercury, first of all, we have to use inotropes and vasopressors. Diuretics we can use when the perfusion is corrected. And if the systolic blood pressure is more than 90, then we can use vasodilators, diuretics, and inotropes. Now, dry and warm patient, that means the patient having no congestion and adequate peripheral perfusion. These are actually compensated group. We should need to adjust the oral therapy only. But dry and cold patient, that is those having inadequate perfusion, these are hypovolemic patients. So we should consider fluid challenge as well as inotropic agents. These are the common vasodilators that we use in emergency and coronary care unit. So the refractory heart failure is my last management. So it is also known as advanced or stage D heart failure, which means presence of progressive or persistent severe signs of symptoms of heart failure, despite optimal medical, surgical and device therapy. Who are these patients? Those having repeated hospitalization in the past year, progressive renal deterioration, cardiac achexia, intolerance to drugs like ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, all the symptoms of NIHA class four, progressive decline in serum sodium, recent need to escalate diuretics. So what can we do in these group of patients? We need to restrict fluid. We consider con continuous intravenous inotropes, we can use experimental drugs and finally end of life decision like palliative care and hospice. So challenges in heart failure management is the ACE inhibitors and beta blockers is still remaining underused. Hyperkalemia and diuretic resistance may pose a challenge and balance between improving symptoms versus improving prognosis is very difficult in these patients. Now let's move, move back to the case scenario one, where there is elderly gentleman with chronic heart failure, having three drugs at maximum doses, still feeling symptomatic. So what we can do in this patient, we can replace the ramipril with an army. And what we can ask the patient, we have to ask the patient to stop ramipril for 36 hours, then we will start army. My second case, the 52 year old woman with acute heart failure. And also she is uh, tachycardic and her blood pressure is 60 by 40. So she will be categorized as wet and cold patient as she has congestion, features of congestion. And as the patient has less than 90 systolic blood pressure, we should initiate inotropes first with vasopressors, then we will start the diuretics. So before conclusion, I'd like to say that due to in a developing country like our Bangladesh, there is also financial restraints and also lack of resources. We should give more emphasis on general measures and prevention. Thank you all. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Abida. That was an excellent presentation on the management of heart failure. Thank you very much. Uh, so our last presenter is Dr. Farid Mohsin, associate professor. He will be talking about the device therapy in the patients with heart failure. Dr. Khalid Mohsin, please, can you share your screen? Learned panelists and dear participants and my co-speakers, uh, I would like to recapitulate a very uh, traditional word of wisdom from our uh, pioneer and spiritual leader of cardiology of our country, Professor, National Professor Dr. M. M. Malek Sir. As all roads lead to Rome, all cardiac disease, if not treated properly, will lead to cardiac failure, whether it is a congenital disease or an acquired disease. And my three previous speakers have very nicely uh, elaborated the every aspect of heart failure, uh, starting from the pathophysiology, the clinical features, the investigation, and uh, pharmacological management. It has left to me me as a like a four-man relay race the fourth person has the responsibility of crossing the finishing line as soon as possible uh, actually uh, the non-pharmacological management uh, that uh, my previous speaker abida has nicely said the uh, the features of the pharmacological uh, management, aspect of pharmacological management, diet, nutrition, exercise. Only one thing I would uh, like to add in her armamentarium that the, a formal cardiac rehabilitation, it is very important in management of heart failure. And uh, 
uh, some uh, of our uh, heart foundation is also uh, moving towards that direction and a, a specialized heart failure uh, department has been established in Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University under the dynamic leadership of our uh, beloved teacher, Professor Shwajal Krishna Banerjee. And they are moving in the right direction. Let's uh, recapitulate the other things which are left in the management, the devices which include implantable cardioverter defibrillator, card cardiac desynchronization therapy, left ventricular assist device, impedance monitoring, transplantation, and other surgical approaches. Uh, so uh, the just uh, the first of all, the most uh, commonly used device after the pharmacological therapy, and it is a very uh, documented uh, benefit uh, in different clinical trials, is the, uh, the cardiac resynchronization therapy. And it is a very important aspect in management of refractory heart failure. And uh, though it, the cost is prohibitive and the technological aspects are sometimes very challenging, but in some patients it uh, offers a ray of hope. This is a uh, we have we have see that there is a generator. Uh, it is a reality. It's a it's a relatively big generator with uh, three connectors. Uh, we can see clearly one connector is for the right atrial lead, which is uh, here in the right atrial appendage. The another lead in the right ventricular apex which has got two coils in it because in a, in a defibrillator form it has coils and in the, in the, is the in the pacemaker form this is which we call the crtp they don't have a defibrillator coil and another lead which is uh, the lv lead or the coronary sinus lead uh, it is uh, also effect, uh, placed in the anterolateral aspect of the heart and it helps to synchronize the chaotic ventricular activity in an orderly fan fashion, improving the cardiac output, decrease the mitral regurgitation, uh, improves the electrical stability of the heart, uh, and many other aspects. Uh, these are the uh, indications of uh, CRT. It is it's a quite a simplified form. Uh, in a patient with uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and the need of a right ventricular pacing, this is a class one indication. If not, we consider the left ventricular ejection fraction as the, uh, the hard uh, parameter. The, if it is the less than 35%, we classify the patient according to the functional status. The, the mostly the patients of functional class three and four, uh, they are offered this therapy. And among this group of patients, if the QRS duration is more than 150 milliseconds and the morphology, if, is, if it is left bundle branch block, it is a class one indication. If it is a, not a left bundle branch block, but it's still the QRS is very wide, it is a class two A indication. If the patient has got an atrial fibrillation, the benefit is some, somewhat jeopardized and the uh, it is the indication is class 2a if it is a qrs duration of 130 to 149 milliseconds if still it is a left band bundle branch block morphology as per the european guideline it is class 1 but for the other guidelines it is class 2a indication and if it is a non lbb morphology this is a class 2b indication if the patient is in functional class 2 and the QRS is more than 150 millisecond, and the morphology is LBB, it is still a class one indication. It is a non-LBB morphology, it is class two B indication. And the QRS duration, uh, if it is, it, it is as per the uh, European ESC guideline, the, uh, if it is uh, the LBB morphology, it is a class 2A indication in, as per other guidelines. And it is a, 
the as per the European guideline, is class one indication. And if it is non-LBB morphology, is with a narrow QRS, it's a class three indication. And the, the if the patient is in functional class one, if the QRS duration is more than 150 milliseconds of LBB morphology, with ejection fraction is less than 30 percent, uh, it is a class two B indication. In let's uh, consider the patients in whom CRT is not a viable option in management, where the patient is un unlikely to live for at least one year due to the comorbidities, and the heart failure patient uh, with the non-LBB pattern, where it is a consensus, uh, in particularly in uh, the developed uh, developing countries like us where the patient has got a no LBBB and the reduction, uh, the QRS is less than 150, it is, it's not very much encouraged. And in patients with a QRS of less than 120 milliseconds, uh, with uh, only eco evidence of dyssynchrony. Uh, it has been shown in uh, some trials that if we choose a, the device on bas basis of only eco evidence, uh, the most of the patient don't benefit. These are the uh, summary of the findings of different clinical trials, the, uh, including the uh, class of uh, uh, evidence. It has been shown in many clinical trials that CRT uh, is beneficial uh, it, uh, in terms of symptom and in terms of morbidity and mortality. There are some uh, uh, well-designed well clinical trials like MUSTIC trials, which choose patients with more than 150 milliseconds, the PATH CHA1 and 2, QRS more than 120 milliseconds, Miracle ICD, QRS more than 130 milliseconds, CARE heart failure, QRS more than 120 milliseconds. They employed the only the CRTP, the companion trial, QRS more than 120 milliseconds. They all showed reduced all cause of mortality in patients with advanced heart failure who are refractory to medical therapy. And this group of, in all these trials, the patient showed at least one NYHA class improvement of their symptoms. The MADID CRT trial, it's a trial, uh, it's a comparison between CRT and ICD, 41% reduction in the first heart failure event showed better response in women. Reverse trial, 53% reduction in first heart failure hospitalization. It favored the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Block heart failure trial, uh, they showed better results in with biventricular pacing co compared to right ventricular pacing only. The REF trial uh, the showed better result in uh, of CRT compared to ICD in terms of death and admission due to heart failure. The desired trial, the QRS in uh, the uh, enrolled patient with less than 120 milliseconds uh, with mechanical dyssynchrony uh, or the on uh, eco the predicted response, the esteem CRT, uh, they, they were selected on the basis of tissue Doppler imaging. Uh, the patients all had a narrow QRS. They showed that no significant favorable response with CRT. The eco CRT, uh, they employed mechanical dyssynchrony, uh, and they also didn't show much benefit in a patient with QRS of less than 120 millisecond. The PACE trial, the RV apical pacing, pacing leads to LV dysfunction, and uh, in a patient with bradycardia, uh, in a patient with LV jeopardized LV function, so CRT was the, clearly the uh, therapy of choice. The biopace, uh, it showed that the biventricular pacing is better than RV pacing in the patients with uh, atrioventricular block. The ICD indication, there are the two types of indication, the primary prevention and the secondary prevention. The secondary prevention are the uh, well-documented. Uh, they have uh, the survivors of cardiac arrest, the third, sustained VT, which cannot be ablated, syncope due to complex ventricular arrhythmia. Uh, they are all 
uh, they conclusively the ICD is indicated. And in cases of primary prevention, uh, these are the patients who are not eligible NYHA class four because they are liable to pump failure, the cardiogenic shock, see revascularization within last three months, or the patients are waiting for coronary revascularization, irreversible brain damage, uh, and other causes which jeopardize the one year survival of the patient. This sort of patients should be excluded for ICD therapy. And in case of primary prevention, uh, the MI, which have, they have uh, 40 days have been uh, passed after an MI, and the ejection fraction uh, is significantly uh, low. Uh, the le in less than 40 day a year, a days of after MI, it is better to manage the patient medically and reassess after 40 days. And in the patients uh, who have uh, ejection fraction less than 30, but 40 days have elapsed after MI, they are NYHA class one. Uh, they they have a they have to be uh, recommended for uh, ICD therapy. And if the patients are uh, NYHA class one to three, uh, they have uh, non-sustained VT prior MI uh, and inducible VT and VF by EP study. They have uh, they are uh, they are class one candidates. And NYHA class two to three. Uh, they have to be uh, considered for ICD implantation as well. And uh, those, who pa those patients who have a QRS of more than 150 millisecond and the LBB, they should be considered for CRT implantation. So the primary prevention, the evidences are not that robust, but in cases of secondary prevention, uh, uh, the, it is a very robust clinical evidence are in favor of ICD implantation. In what are those patients where ICD are to be avoided? Uh, NYHA class four patients who are uh, not expected to improve with therapy and who are not uh, candidates for cardiac transplantation or mechanical circulatory support. The patient with uh, coronary artery disease, LV systolic dysfunction, and recurrent hospitalization for heart failure, who uh, are, should probably not receive an ICD as their survival is likely to be very much jeopardized due to pump failure. So the arrhythmic death is not a very important consideration in this group of patients. And patients uh, with uh, significant LV dysfunction but they don't have high risk features of sudden cardiac death like complex arrhythmia on Holter or inducible uh, VT and VF by EP study. So they are not the classical candidates for ICD implant. The, the, some, many studies have uh, been the, evaluated the benefit of ICD, the dynamate, the CABG patch trials, the they don't, did not show much benefit of ICD as a primary prevention measures in a patient with severe LB dysfunction. But these two studies, MADIT2 and SCD heart failure trial has shown that ICD has uh, reduced overall mortality as a, as a measure of primary prevention. Uh, the measure, mortality uh, benefit was about uh, in uh, in cases of uh, in 14.2 percent with uh, ICD and 19.8 percent with uh, optimized medical therapy, the p value is significant, and the sudden cardiac death uh, reduction is also significantly lower. And uh, the meta analysis showed uh, the different trials that uh, in secondary prevention, the results are quite robust and uh, the reduction of overall mortality about 28% and arrhythmic, arrhythmia related mortality about 50%. And, but we should not forget that the medical therapy is also quite good. 
uh, like uh, the AC inhibitor can reduce mortality by 6.1%, beta blocker by 4.4%. Um, aldosterone antagonists also, they are quite helpful in reducing mortality. Then after the uh, implantable, uh, the pacing devices or the ICD and C CRT, the other options are the intraortic balloon pump, which are used uh, commonly in the coronary care unit, cath labs, and as well as in the operating theater and post-operative period. They augment the coronary flow and they reduce the afterload. The, the other, the, but they are been largely being replaced by impeller, though it is a very costly one, the impeller 2.5, impeller 5, impeller recovery, and the cheap cases, mainly the high risk intervention is being done under support of impeller, though unfortunately this device is not available in our country. ECMO, it, uh, its uh, use has been highlighted in the uh, COVID era, particularly the refractory hypoxia with uh, cardiac function deterioration, the ECMO is a very good choice. The left ventricular uh, assist device, uh, they are implantable devices uh, for quite a, a prolonged support to the heart and circulation. And they are bridge to the procedures and they, can prepare a patient for cardiac transplantation as well. These are the indications of uh, induction of mechanical support, frequent hospitalization for heart failure, uh, NYHA class 3, 4 symptom with maximal therapy, and NYHA, uh, then the intolerance to commonly used medication, the increasing diuretic requirement, symptom in spite of CRT implantation, dependency on ionotropic support, the low peak uh, oxygen consumption, and end organ dysfunction, which may be due to low cardiac output. In this scope of patient, we should actively consider the mechanical support. There are some contraindications of mechanical support as well. Uh, the, some of them are absolute, like the irreversible hepatic dysfunction, neurological dysfunction, uh, severe uh, psychological uh, limitation, like uh, then the non-adherence to therapy, the relative contention, advanced age, uh, advanced renal impairment, uh, the obesity, malnutrition, uh, the impaired musculoskeletal uh, disease uh, which limits the uh, mobility of an individual, the systemic uh, infection, uncontrolled systemic infection, the prolonged mechanical ventilation, uh, malignancy which likely to jeopardize the longevity, peripheral vascular disease, substance abuse, cognitive dysfunction, uh, lack of social support. These are the uh, relative, absolute and relative contraindication of mechanical support. The impeller is a very attractive option uh, in mechanical support. It is very easy to install and easy to withdraw, but the prohibitive aspect is the cost. It is a, a catheter-based pump, which uh, the, uh, the, in, uh, the uh, pump is inside the ventricle and it propels the blood to the aorta, aortic valve, and uh, to the aorta, and it improves the ventricular performance and give rest to the left ventricular musculature and helps it to recover if there is a reversible cause of myocardial dysfunction. And it is a very good adjunctive in high-risk uh, coronary intervention in the cath lab, particularly the chip cases. Left ventricular assist devices are surgically uh, implanted devices. These are also a pump which uh, can support the circulation on a temporary or a permanent basis uh, to augment a failing heart. The, the principle is to 
divert the blood from the failing ventricle and to rest the ventricle, but uh, but uh, but maintaining the cardiac output in an alternative manner. So how does it work? There is an inflow that collects the blood from the left ventricle and the blood is passed to the pump and the blood is delivered uh, to the aorta and thereby bypassing the ventricle and giving rest and the inflow and the outflow component are uh, placed surgically inside the pericardial cavity and a electrical line which exists uh, through the uh, iliac fossa and connects to a rechargeable battery. And we have seen in the social media that uh, the patients are quite mobile. They carry the battery and the pump and they, are, they lead a quite an active life, but with some limitation of activity. So how the LVAD use has got four aspects. Uh, number one is a bridge to transplant for end stage heart failure who are waiting for a donor heart. We, as we all know, the donor heart is quite difficult to get. So, and as a destination therapy, it is the final uh, therapy for them who are not candidates of cardiac transplantation due to various contraindications. We'll come later on what are the contraindications of cardiac transplant. And a bridge to cardiac transplant when initially the patient is very sick, but with this device, the patient may improve functionally and be a candidate of cardiac transplantation at a later period. And it is a, can be used as a bridge to recovery, like patients with severe myocarditis, and this support can help the patient recuperate from the myocarditis. And, uh, and following recovery, this device can be removed from the body. Here, this is the heart, and the, here is the collection point from uh, left ventricle and this blood it, it is acting as an inflow to the pump and this pump is delivering the blood to the aorta and uh, and this is a shoulder strap and the battery is here and the electrical uh, 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 this is a rechargeable battery uh, and it is delivering the current to the pump so this device, it schematically looks simple, but it is quite cumbersome to carry this device. And uh, the common uh, one used here uh, in uh, the popular devices are, are HeartMate 2 and 3. These are approved by the FDA and the ESC. This is another uh, view of this device the collection from the LV and delivery to the uh, aorta, giving rest to the uh, left ventricle, which is the dominant ventricle. And left ventricular assist device, uh, it presently, it is a class 2B indication. There is another uh, technique which is used uh, as a uh, mechanical augmentation of diastolic coronary flow. This is the ECP. Uh, this uh, can be employed in uh, cases where the options of uh, revascularization has been exhausted uh, and the transplantation or the LVAD is not feasible, uh, particularly in very hopeless situation. They, some patients do improve during the procedure, uh, it is a, a six week therapy, but after the procedure is uh, over, the patient's symptoms tend to recur. So it is not a, a very viable option. And another is the, uh, the shock wave therapy, like the ESWL, it helps to uh, the, uh, the gro growth of collaterals in the heart. Uh, it is also an option, but it is not uh, that uh, scientifically recommended. Coronary revascularization is an important aspect uh, of uh, 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 refractory heart failure when, when there is a viable myocardium. Uh, as 80% of the patients of heart failure have coronary disease. And in this group of patients, we must be uh, sure of the viability of the myocardium. 
the non viable myocardial if revascularized by intervention or surgery is not going to help the patient so it has to be uh, just uh, evaluated very meticulously by cardiac mri or the uh, myocardial perfusion imaging and then revascularization should be undertaken these are the uh, uh, surgical option uh, but uh, not used uh, commonly nowadays the, the cardiomyoplasty using the latissimus dorsi uh, wrapped around the heart and the reductive ventriculoplasty reducing the diameter of lv and reducing the myocardial wall stress the batistopathy these are almost abundant uh, and the valvular replacement and repair is a very important aspect of uh, treating end stage heart failure uh, the as the lv dilates if even the valve is morphologically normal significant mitral regurgitation can develop and uh, the ischemic mr uh, up to certain extent can be corrected by revascularization but if it is severe the mitral valve repair or replacement needs to be done and the interventional procedures like mitral clip tever it can be done where the surgical risk is too high if uh, for the and this is the uh, cardiac rehabilitation uh, sorry cardiac transplantation the the indications are patient persistently in which in class 4 uh, the the patient failed to manage uh, improve in more than 45 days and the intraortic balloon pump has been given for more than 7 days and the ionotrope dependency for more than 40 days 14 days ef is less than 25% and uh, the peak oxygen consumption is less than 14 ml per kg per minute unless the patient is on a mechanical device and this in and this group of patient uh, who are uh, the age should be less than 60 years no uh, life threatening comorbidities at least the patient is expected to survive at least uh, at least one year so these are the patients who can consider Uh, for cardiac transplantation and some patients who are at at a point of time are unsuitable but may improve with lvad left ventricular assist device sorry the cardiac transplantation the one year survival is about 90% and 10 year survival is 50 to 60% and these are the uh, the comorbidities we don't expect to find in a potential transplant recipient like end stage renal disease severe pulmonary hypertension severe liver disease life threatening malignancy these are the exclusion criteria these are the summary of the surgical procedures which are likely to help a patient with heart failure the heart transplant is the final therapy the mechanical support revascularization ventricular reconstruction the lv aneurysm repair is also one of the most most important aspect and the these are the myositis restoration the stem cell therapy but the efficacy is doubtful the mitral valve reconstruction the these are the uh, the myo splint and the cardiomyoplasty these are the histo uh, are of historical importance so the surgery plays an important role and another thing uh, the inter among the interventional procedures the mechanical complication following myocardial infarction like the ventricular septal uh, device closure is also a very important uh, uh, aspect of treatment because these patients are going to Uh, intractable heart failure and pump failure in the uh, very short and intermediate uh, term these are the analogy of the donkey and the cart the donkey if the load of the cart is very it's beyond the capacity the donkey gets tired and is becomes exhausted so to get the donkey going uh, we have to uh, the limit the speed or we have to reduce the load already described by the 
Dr. Abida, and so by by reduction of the load, the efficiency of the donkey can be improved. We can stimulate the donkey with some uh, food or something like that to help to stimulate to it help stimulate to work better. And we can put some device in the donkey's feet like the roller coaster and these are the this roller coaster is the devices to improve the efficiency of the donkey and we must consider that the heart is a very fragile organ and we must uh, extend out utmost care to the heart uh, the cardiologist interventionist cardiac they should handle the heart with much care and thanks for your patient hearing and uh... thank you thank you dr khalid mohsin that was elaborate discussion on device therapy and heart failure uh, we are glad that uh, professor shazal banerji has joined us uh, sir are you there shazal banerji sir was there i think he left again okay so I think uh, after a long discussion, uh, we should have some talk. So let's start with Professor Meshkat, Chaudhary Meshkat. Meshkat, Meshkat Rai. Please comment on all the discussion, please. We have got a few questions, but I think we'll discuss later. First, we list our Meshkat. Uh, unmute, please, unmute. It is an... Uh, immense pleasure to be with National Heart Foundation, not because all great people are there, but also because that I can learn so many things from, from the presentation. All the presentation that I have attended so far was so rich and so well designed and so uh, beautifully being presented. I, I'm really spellbound with those presentations and I have learned so many things. The presenters had been excellent altogether. So any 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 comment about the management and uh, anything? Any, yeah, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, and of course I have got a comment on the management and a little talk about the HEPA, which is now really a hot debate and a lot of information are really coming over the last few months and a lot of information are going to come in next year. Uh, we have we have some newer drug which are really being very effective like. SGL2 receptor. Uh, in recent uh, recent congress on heart failure by American Heart Association, they have they have recommended and they have uh, they have understand the values of treating the heart failure with four drugs uh, because uh, there are there are we knew there there had been three pathways uh, the uh, angiotensin pathway the mineralocorticoid pathway the sympathetic pathway. And we also came to know about the napolysin, that is peptide pathway. And now we know about the sodium glucose transport, co-transporter pathway. All these four, five pathway actually, they work parallel. They do not really uh, exceed the limit of one and another. So maybe it, it can be wise for a refractory, refractory cases to use uh, all the four drugs together. We know the beta blocker will act on the sympathetic, will act as sympathetic blocker, the angiotensin receptor as angiotensin receptor blocker, the mineral of corticoid receptor blocker also will have. We have the nephrolysin, nep which will block the peptide path pathway, and SGL2 has got different pathway to act, up, act upon. So uh, by using ARNI, we can block the both angiotensin and the uh, peptide pathway. So there are three drugs for four pathway. And we now have an extra pathway. Maybe we will be able to use that. In next year, it, the things will be more clearer. But many results, especially the Pioneer 2 result and the uh, uh, paradigm, paradigm studies, all, all studies have shown if, if not only for the severe cases, not only for the refractory cases, if, we can, uh, if you can use ARNI in patient who has been hospitalized or who has been who has got the hospital admission for the first time, probably they are also the candidate for, for ARNI instead of uh, only angiotensin or AC receptor blocker. So, so in next six months, many interesting things will be done in the arena of 
treating the heart failure. We will we, have to be watchful about that because after all this modern treatment, uh, after optimizing all the drug and the, and the devices, still the mortality for the heart failure is more than 15% in stable cases. It is more so in unstable cases. So we need to do a lot more on the treatment of heart failure. As regard investigation, uh, lung ultrasound is quite attract attractive uh, a choice. It's very simple to use, very simple to learn. And one of our students are doing work on that. The V-line are very easy to find out. We can use it in, in our day-to-day uh, -day practice. In echocardiography, we also have to look at many more, more parameters that can help, in, help us in deciding some, uh, uh, some therapeutic option. For example, uh, uh, if we have to also look at the right ventricle and the pulmonary hypertension, we can really tell about the prognosis of a patient with heart failure. So echocardio and the and the strain, uh, the study of strain also gives some focus on the etiological uh, origin of the uh, heart failure. So nowadays, echocardiography has much more extended role for heart failure. As regard PISA rejection fraction, it is it is a completely different entity. Although some people do not agree that this is a different entity, but our experience in BSM, my personal experience as echocardiography, it exists, but there is different genetic, uh, there is genetic heterogeneity, there is phenotypic heterogeneity, and there is therapeutic heterogeneity as well. We, we today, none of, of today, we say that, say that we do not have any treatment for hep pair. But if you look at the uh, Paragon study and also the Paradigm study carefully, the patient who, uh, who, who were left in the mid-range zone and the female patient, they really derive some benefit from the, uh, uh, from the ARNI treatment. And uh, in TopCat study also, the mineralocorticoid corticoid receptor antagonist uh, had some, uh, some uh, beneficial effect on hep when the patient were remaining in the mid-range uh, ejection fraction. So uh, within the study, we have many subtypes of group of people who can be benefited with different form of treatment. So tre treating heart failure is going to be one of the state of art, very fine state of art. And for that, we really need to have a specialized heart failure, failure unit. And there is an interesting trial as, as well for hep uh, so long device is concerned. So there is a study which is looking at the, uh, at the communication between the right atrium and the left atrium to decrease the load of the left atrium. The, tr the trial is on horizon, uh, the decreasing uh, LAP is the trial. So it will be look at if we can make an interventional shunt between left atrium and the right atrium by decreasing the left atrial pressure, whether the longevity of left uh, uh, patient with left ventricle hep pep will be improved. So a lot more things, interesting things are going to be observed in the next year. Uh, these are all my comments about heart failure. Thank you, Dr. Mishkat. That was, uh, that was excellent discussion about heart failure. I have some, uh, just I have a query, uh, Dr. Abida, uh, regarding the use of RNA. I think the European Society and American Heart Association, they have got different uh, uh, way of using it. Uh, one group, uh, they use, want to use um, RNA from the very beginning, upfront. Yes, and uh, another group, they use RNA only resistant case. So which one you favor? Which will be, which one is better? Either to use RNA upfront or to wait for the resistant patient then use RNA. So actually, yes, the updated focus update of SCAHA 2017 shows that they can we can start our needs from beginning. And, and another thing is uh, the uh, ESC guideline showed that we can uh, use RNA depending on the anti-pro BNP. That is, if the patient's anti-pro BNP is more than 150 picogram per ml, sorry, BNP more than 150 picogram per ml and anti-pro BNP more than 600 picogram per ml and patient is hospitalized in last one year, even once, then we can start RNA depending on this BNP level. level. And uh, so in that case, uh, we can use RNA if, depending on the patient's pro BNP and anti-pro BNP level. And another thing is uh, regarding the cost effectivity, uh, the, in our country as Ramipril and these ACE inhibitors are widely available and 
and these are cost effective. So in our Bangladeshi perspective, I think, sir, you can tell that from experience, like whether we can use RD from the beginning as thinking about the patient's financial condition. Thank you. Regarding HGL2 receptor blocker, so yes, what, what, yeah, what, what is your take on this HGL2? Yes, Dr. Mishra has already mentioned about yes, it. Yes, how it, uh, mechanism, it's the pathway of sodium glucose transport pathway. Yeah. Yes, sir. As it works in the proximal convoluted tubule, this uh, sodium glucose co-transporter too, uh, uh, that is inhibitor, that is already, there is recommendation in ESC guideline in stage A and stage B heart failure that it shows that it prevents heart failure symptom by treatment of diabetes mellitus. It is already in the guideline. And recently, Lancet has, has published several papers where it shows that in DAPA heart failure trial, they have seen that irrespective of diabetes, diabetes mellitus present or not, the, the uh, SGL2 inhibitor has shown morbidity and as well as mortality benefit. But the thing is, still the results are yet to be confirmed whether it has uh, long-term values. So we can wait, but uh, it can be a, an important alternative and also an important addition in the recent future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have one query to Dr. Uh, Dr. Khaled Mohsen. Regarding the use of uh, CRT in a patient with uh, non-LBBB, actually uh, nowadays uh, a good number of patients with non-LBBB white complex tachycardia are getting CRT with little benefit actually. Yeah. And uh, recently I have, uh, I have attended a lecture, international lecture, they have seen that non-LBBB, uh, non uh, even if it is white complex, not going to help with CRTD. Only L even they have said that LBBB, with non ischemic cardiomyopathy is the highest responder non ischemic yes. cardiomyopathy with lbbb white complex tachycardia they are the highest responder but nowadays even the rbbb rbb with 0.14 uh, are, we, are, we are placing uh, give crt with very little response so what do you take should we continue like this because this costs a lot for the patient and we find little benefit for the patient even the guidelines doesn't support it yes Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Budhijan, for a very, very pertinent question. Uh, actually, uh, in uh, patients uh, with, uh, uh, with the refractory heart failure, our goal is to improve their quality of life. That is the main thing. And their longevity is uh, definitely is a second uh, on the priority list, actually. So we all know that the ICDs, they you cannot contribute in improving the quality of life of a patient, but uh, CRT does. But as there is a quite a, a gap in the uh, expenditure between ICD and CRT, so we have to consider the cost. But in some cases, when the RBBB is a very quite very wide QRS complex, uh, in sometimes we give. Uh, uh, the ICD, uh, uh, sorry, we give the CRT uh, 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 in particularly in cases of non ischemic cardiomyopathy. In this group of patients, we can uh, offer them the CRTP. Uh, the co cost is quite uh, less than the CRTD. And in this group of patients, it's a class 2A indication if the QRS complex is more than 150 milliseconds. And in this group of patients, we give them as a benefit of doubt and we program the device in a separate way so that the, uh, the, the ventricular activation sequence is changed. And if we can program the device in a very, uh, in a, uh, according to their need, I think that some of the patients, they improve, uh, in particularly the non-LBV patient. I, Dr. Ashok Dotto is with here. He has got a quite a significant experience in implanting the devices. Any, any comment, Dr. Ashok? Ashok, regarding yes. non lbv yes. patients. Thank you, sir. Uh, that is uh, really hot, hot you actually link that in uh, RBB with white complex, even if it is, if it is more than 150, uh, response rate is poor, especially in ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy, but in non ischemic cardiomyopathy, overall CRT uh, resynchronization got a better result. That is true for LBB with white uh, RBB with white complex also. So, in that case, sometimes uh, they recommend 2A 
uh, somewhere to be because there is no other way. Very resistant to all uh, anti failure therapy, even with RNA diuretics. In that case, that may be the uh, only last hope. hope. Last hope. Yeah. Exactly, sir. Our, I have got one question regarding uh, RNA that is a very far I have using uh, many cases, very potent anti hypertensive cell. So, yeah. uh, and uh, also the uh, MPI and uh, DAPA, the, that uh, with uh, other anti hypertensive that uh, I think has got synergistic effect because of his diuresis. Many a re resistant patient uh, with lipazide or DAPA, they reduce the blood pressure very rapidly. Other thing is RNA, can it be used? Can it be used in patients with resistant or nearly resistant hypertension, uh, with LB hypertrophy, there is risk of uh, heart failure. Like many patients with this type of patient, resistant hypertension, LB hypertrophy, gross hypertrophy, LB has got uh, class two symptom. So RNA, can we use in the, that cases? as an antihypertensive, as an anti-failure, or as an, uh, what uh, Bodhi Jamsar was telling. I, I, uh, I think both uh, is as a preventive measure, right? So, as a preventive uh, measure. Preventive as well as anti-hypertensive. That is Shamim Dakhalaja class uh, uh, stage one. You can a patient is not NIH1, not, nor NIH2, but patient is potentially at risk of heart failure, developing heart failure. Otherwise, so stage two, can can patient, is, uh, patient is at risk of developing heart failure, but has no symptoms. In that case, I don't think till now there is any study which suggests that RNA can be used at this stage, which will which may prevent uh, heart failure or progression up to heart failure. As another uh, question to Dr. Ashok Dost or Dr. Khaled Mohsen, please, regarding the uh, uh, another procedure that's called CCM, cardiac contraction modulation. Uh, do you know about it? Con uh, cardiac contraction modulation. These, uh, these are for the patients with narrow complex tachycardia, narrow complex uh, non LBV patient who are not responding to CRT. The CCM is coming up uh, with a new mo modulation, uh, which they are saying that they are responding much with CCM. Uh, Dr. Khalid Mohsin, I think. Uh, yes, this is an option. Uh, this is a, one of the, uh, it is called the multi site tracing modality. Actually, the RV is placed at different uh, sites in the patients who have LV dysfunction and without the, uh, the favorable QRS morphology. So in this group of patients, uh, they can be uh, benefited by multi-site pacing, uh, two or three sites uh, they, they can, but it's still not commonly used in clinical practice. Now it is, and another option is uh, in patients who are pacing dependent, the his bundle pacing also uh, is uh, beneficial uh, because the deterioration of LV function can be prevented by using the normal uh, electrical conduction pathway. Because uh, even we, if we pace the, uh, if we avoid the RV pacing by pacing the septum, this is relatively better, but it is not uh, free from all the uh, disadvantages of RV pacing. But in this group of patients, the his bundle pacing by using a specialized lead system uh, is, is, is beneficial. I, I think uh, Ashok can add something on this. Yes, sir. Uh, we have uh, CRT or double uh, dual ventricle, biventricular pacing. Uh, last ESC uh, on uh, in a session, I have seen that an Italian person always he used to pace the right atrium and his bundle. If failed, then left bundle. And if his bundle or left bundle pacing failed, then he used to do the left ventricular plus right ventricular pacing. So this is his. Uh, all the cases, more than uh, 100 cases, he did like this. So this is the 
now to him CRT is the last option when his file or left bundle branch spacing is tight. But a lot of disadvantages is there like uh, lead loss is one of the uh, complication that may happens. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. Uh, Dr. Dhiman Bonik, are you there? Dhiman, it's not there. So uh, we are already too late. Uh, uh, Professor Fazila Malik, uh, Madam, are you there? I am here. So, so, please, uh, so can you make some final comments about the session? This was a fantastic session. I learned such a lot. And uh, our panel of experts was excellent. And great moderation by you. It was very diverse. Lots of knowledge. Great presentation. Thank you so much. We really enjoyed the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. for uh, Professor Mishka, I think you have some final words to say. You, are, you got... Can someone want to add something last? last? Yeah, maybe I will, I'll take a little time. Uh, uh, there was a breakthrough study no, known as Pioneer Heart Failure Study, which shows after the patient is readmitted for heart, heart failure and he has been stabilized. But within two months of discharge from the hospital, uh, there was a study in one arm, there was AC inhibitor, and in another arm, there was ARNI. In initial two months, there was marked reduction in mortality. So other than the refractory heart failure group of patients and who are readmitted in the hospital, maybe a good candidate for ARNI, at least for two months, because this study has, has been an elegant study and its implication is quite high. There are two other drugs are there in the horizon. This is all patients irrespective of ejection fraction, sir. This is all patients irrespective of ejection fraction. Uh, uh, Mortality benefit was there. Ejection fraction there. So all the patient with ejection fraction, low ejection fraction, normal? Uh, it, these drugs are only, you can apply when the patient's uh, hemodynamics are, can permit. Also, there are two new drugs. One is uh, uh, very sick got and the uh, amino uh, aminocarbid carabids. Both these drugs also may have different mechanisms, especially myosin, uh, myosin chain activator, that is inotropic drug. And when in many cases we cannot yes, apply yes. the doses in up, up titrated dose because of uh, low blood pressure. So they are the option when we have low blood pressure and we still have the refractory heart failure, then we can verico got and, and the uh, amino, uh, amino uh, uh, um, uh, that is uh, myosin light chain activator. These are the options uh, are being recommended. We can uh, really apply apply those. But heart failure is a heterogeneous heterogeneous uh, group of people, and we really have to individualize each patient, and we have to learn about the art of treating each patient separately. For example, many cases in our refractory heart failure, we add thiazide with fusimide, and that acts. We also have in our uh, in our arm numb and the uh, evapridine. Yeah, that, 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 that also works to some extent. And in some patients with right heart failure, uh, with severe ascites, heavy dose of spironolactone does the trick for them. So it, the different patient with different heart failure has got different uh, therapeutic implications. Uh, thank you. Thank you for giving me that space. Uh, thank you, Professor Mishkat. Uh, just uh, before you conclude, I would like to have your own opinion of Fazila, madam, uh, regarding are you missing the impeller device when you are being very high risk, complete? Well, actually, I mean, impeller sounds very good to me. Uh, it's whether I'm missing it in certain situations, definitely, but the expense is so much, isn't it? So, it's beyond our, uh, yeah, it's, too it's expensive. very expensive. And the other thing is, you know, uh, this device cannot be used in mo many patients. Like, uh, who are the most sick patients? The most sick patients are those who are very frail, who have usually peripheral vascular disease, and you might have a challenge even taking the impella up, right? So maybe you would have to use it through the axilla or something. 
but uh, definitely uh, this is a very relevant thing i think in our center we should and in also in bangladesh in the life it comes maybe it might make a difference because for very high risk patients yeah, thank uh, you for the uh, comment. Chief, uh, Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu, uh, she was given Impella when she was in the last last stage of her. Yeah, uh, but she didn't make it. She died, right? She died, yeah, she died. So actually, uh, yeah, it's an excellent device. Only okay. you have, as you have yes, mentioned, that the problem is with the cost. It's a very high, high cost and it cannot be used. That's the problem. So thank you very much, everyone, all the panelists, uh, Professor Meshkat and all the uh, presenter. Uh, to announcement, we don't have uh, any presentation next uh, Wednesday because of our annual conference. So our next session will be on the 9th of uh, December, uh, Wednesday. Till then, uh, goodbye and good luck. Have a nice sleep. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you.